Hi, I'm Carrie Kanoski, and this is Kidney Cancer News. This month, we'll have presentations from the experts in the treatment of renal cancers. But first, Bill Bro has a report on how grapefruit may boost a cancer drug. Drinking a glass of grapefruit juice a day could dramatically increase the effectiveness of cancer drugs. As reported in the Mail Online by Claire Bates, patients who combine the fruit with a specific anti-cancer drug receive the same benefit as they would from taking more than three times the dose of the medicine itself. University of Chicago researchers said the combination could help patients avoid side effects associated with high doses of the drug and reduce the cost of medication. In a study published in Clinical Cancer Research, the team showed that patients who drank eight ounces of grapefruit daily increased their serolimus levels by 350 percent. Serolimus or rapamycin is used to prevent rejection and organ transplantation, but it's also being tested as a treatment for certain tumors. No patients in the study had a complete response, but about 30 percent of the initial three trials had stable disease, meaning their cancers did not advance. One patient taking grapefruit juice had a partial response, that is, significant tumor shrinkage that lasted for more than three years. Reporting from suburban Chicago, I'm Bill Bro. So this was uh, his outline for the talk, and it wasn't so much on novel therapies. It was more about clinical trials, why they're important, um, talking about a little bit more about the different types of clinical trials, what's gone on in the past, which we've, uh, it's been well covered by others, particularly Dr. Yonash, but also some of the planned and current trials that are going on that should give us some information in the next year or two, um, mostly with a focus on uh, phase two and, and three trials. And probably the most important question of the day, not just for people in this room, but for people uh, listening online is, you know, why should you participate in clinical trials. Uh, what's in it for you? Um, we've obviously talked about what's in it for the field, but what's in it for patients who might want to consider trial participation? So here's a definition of a clinical trial. It's a study conducted to look at both the safety and effectiveness of any health intervention. Could be a drug, could be a device, could be a treatment protocol. Um, they're designed based on certain ethical guidelines, which we follow very closely and we're monitored very closely by folks internally and externally, like the FDA um, and our IRB um, uh, in institutional review boards at all of our institutions. This is one of, uh, this is a list, this, I thought this was a pretty funny list that Dr. Uh, Bukowski came up with from a Persian physician on the ways to conduct clinical trials. This is from 1025 AD, so a thousand years ago. And you can see a list of, you know, some things you want to think about before you're doing clinical trials. I don't know how many clinical trials were done a thousand years ago. I thought the last one was the funniest, number six, it talks about the experimentation must be done um, with the human body, which makes sense, for testing a drug on a lion or a horse might not prove anything about its effect on man. Um, <laughs> we talk a lot about morbidity and mortality to patients on clinical trials. I can't imagine being the investigator on any lion trial. It would probably be higher for the investigators than for the lions. but. I'm glad we've made advances in the last thousand years. This is one of the more famous early uh, medical intervention clinical trials. This was by British investigator James Lind in 1747. He was the first to show and prove that citrus fruits can uh, cure scurvy. He did what was somewhat like a randomized trial is today, comparing the effects of various, various acidic substances such as vinegar, citrus fruits and cider, giving them to uh, patients, um, sailors with scurvy, and essentially proving that um, giving oranges and lemons can improve, uh, can re cause recovery rapidly in patients with vitamin C deficiency. Um, sort of, he's sort of one of the founding fathers of our, our field of uh, clinical investigation, we've, but we've actually come a long way since then. Uh, as far as types of clinical trials, um, they can be classified in different ways. Some are just what are called observational, meaning we collect data that other researchers use uh, to study patterns, um, you know, study outcomes over a long period of time, for example, you know, certain things like r risks for heart disease and cancer, that sort of thing. What we focused on mostly for this meeting are interventional trials where we actually do something to patients, usually with a device or, or, or a therapy, and it's often compared to patients receiving either no treatment or commonly the standard or the old standard of care. 
And there can be many different purposes for clinical trials. Some of them are prevention and some of them are screening, which we haven't talked a lot about yet. Um, and some are more active treatment trials or improving our way of um, diagnosing certain cancers. So there are many different types of trials. There, you often read a lot about different phases of clinical trials. This is sort of an important concept when you're trying to decide whether the trial is right for you. You know, you often want to ask, you know, what phase is this trial? And um, the reason that's important is each phase of clinical testing has a different goal. Um, I'll focus on the ones in the middle here. Phase one often focuses on drug safety. So over the years, it's been about questions like, what's the right dose of a drug? What's the right schedule for a drug? And traditionally, phase one trials have not really been great um, for patients, because the main focus was what's the, what's the safest way to give this drug, not necessarily how effective the drug is. And they were often um, left for patients with few or other options um, when, when, other, when everything had run out. You would consider a phase one trial. But nowadays, phase one trials are changing somewhat. Um, number one, they're not just open for anybody with any type of cancer. More often, they're open for patients with specific types of cancers because there's already some sense of why this drug that was looked interesting in the, in the laboratory might be effective for a specific um, type of cancer. So we're getting a little bit um, more focused in that regard. We're also testing patients, for example, certain tumor characteristics before they go on a clinical trial. So even getting more detailed information than just what type of cancer they have, but hey, what, kind of, uh, what kind of tumor do they have? What kind of genetic changes are going on in that tumor? And most importantly, some phase one trials, once they get the safe dose, are then doing what are called dose expansions, where they take groups of patients with a specific tumor type and treat them all at the same dose, which is essentially doing a phase two trial in what's called a phase one trial. It's a much smaller phase two trial. And in many ways, there are advantages, in my admittedly biased opinion, to being on that kind of a trial, because you know you're getting the drug at that point, you know you're getting a drug that in many cases has shown some sense of safety and activity. And it's certainly something you should consider, not necessarily write off because your doctor says, I want to consider you for a phase one trial. Phase two trials are the you know, sort of the main focus there is effectiveness. How effective is a treatment? And they're usually focused on a single uh, cancer type. And phase three, phase three trials, which we've heard a lot about, um, are more comparative trials, comparing something new uh, to something that's old or standard. And in, for many years, the new was never really better than the old. But one of the things that we I hope we've gotten across in this day is more recently, a lot of the new stuff has been better. Um, and we, also, we often had a sense of it that it might be better before we got to confirming it in uh, phase three trials. One of the uncomfortable things about phase three trials from a patient's point of view is the randomization that makes people very anxious. They're, they don't, you lose a certain amount of control, both physician and patient, over what you're going to receive. But so a lot of people will choose not to go on phase three trials because they're uncomfortable with that process. The, the way I like to look at it, and you know, obviously not from a patient's perspective, is that a, a, even in the randomized trial, you get a 50% chance of trying a new agent earlier. And that may not be for you. It's obviously a very personal choice, but it's at least worth a discussion. It's worth a, a consideration as you go through your um, as you go through your treatment. There often are trials after a drug becomes approved, um, like for example, expanded access trials, where they where they where they offer it to patients um, just to test further questions like uh, like safety, for example. So we talked a little bit about um, sort of clinical trials so far. I want to speak a little bit about caveats. We talked a little bit about randomized trials and how that can often throw people off, but it's, it, it's, it turns out it's the only real way of proving that a new treatment is effective. So as, as many flaws as a randomized trial might have from a patient's perspective, it is here to stay, at least uh, for, the, for the time being. Um, we're still going to be doing randomized trials. There, there's other concepts that are often also th throw people off. One is the whether a trial is blinded. That means, you know, that the, the researcher and the patient may not know what the patient is getting. Um, and you might say, well, why is that? Um, the reason that is, is oftentimes you will make, if you know what someone is receiving, you might make judgments that bias the outcome. And they want to try to reduce that bias, both on the patient side and the physician side. But a lot of people don't like not knowing what they're getting. And the one that throws the most 
you know, wrenches into this is the whole concept of a placebo as a control arm. And that unnerves a lot of people for good reason, but you're going to be told if a placebo is involved, number one, for sure, up front. And most importantly, now that we have effective drugs, placebo controls are less likely to be acceptable options, meaning they're only acceptable if there's no standard treatment. So five and six years ago, when there was no few standard treatments for kidney cancer, we relied on placebos. But for the most part now, most of these new treatments are being compared to active treatment. So you're either getting active treatment A or active treatment B, comparing it to a new treatment. Going forward in kidney cancer, there'll probably be fewer and fewer placebo control trials. Here's a list, you've seen this before, of all the trials that have been done in the last 10 years. And I think the, the important thing about this is it's patient involvement that's made this progress possible. This is a look at, um, you know, eight or nine trials that have enrolled almost 4,000 patients. Um, it's quite a, a long list of, of progress that can only be made by patients' willing, uh, willingness uh, to participate. So it's something to encourage um, people that you know, if they're interested, people you may communicate with online or through email, um, to consider participation, because it's only through that participation do we make this progress, and we clearly have much more progress to, to go. So as, in summarizing our recent advances, we've been able to show that we can uh, shrink tumors um, in up to 10, sometimes 50% of patients with these uh, newly targeted agents that Dr. Yonash was talking about. We can certainly slow tumor growth, which leads to uh, lengthening of survival. So as um, Dr. Hudson was talking about, his patients are living longer. My patients are as well. They're living years longer than they used to um, in the past, but we're still not achieving enough remissions. Um, and we need to work on agents that, that might give us a chance of remission or that benefit once the treatment stops. Um, obviously, we talked about participation. We need to do that to improve outcomes. And hopefully, we, in the future, we can see trials that, um, that better understand the biology of kidney cancer, as Dr. Yonash was talking about, to identify patients before they get treatment and assign them to the treatment most likely to, to help them. It's only through that, not just clinical research, but laboratory research, um, that we'll be able to do that in, in combination. And we really need to increase the funding um, for those um, endeavors because they are, they are rather expensive at a time when the NCI's budget is, is fairly tight. So you hear a lot about personalized medicine uh, in, in treatment of, of, of cancer. We're not yet in the era of personalized medicine for kidney cancer. We are making certain decisions, um, but they're fair, based on fairly rough guidelines. So for example, we're making decisions based on whether a patient's been treated or has had previous uh, or has been untreated. We're trying to assign certain risk categories for certain patients based on clinical features that suggest either a good or a poor prognosis. We're making decisions, as we talked about earlier, based on whether a patient has clear cell or non-clear cell tum tumors. But these are very sort of rough guidelines. We need, we need better ones, obviously. And the hope is that we can, we can come up with um, markers that are based more on the patient's own uh, genetic profile and the, tu and the genetic profile of the patient's uh, tumor. So there's a lot of work going on in that um, as we speak. So recently reported trials, here's a list. You've heard some of this before. These were trials reported in the last year. Um, not all trials are positive. The first one was called the renal effect trial. This was randomizing patients to either the intermittent schedule of Sutent versus the continuous dosing of Sutent. The, th the hope was that by giving it a lower dose um, continuously, it would either be more tolerable or more effective. It turns out there was no difference between those schedules, so they could be used interchangeably. Um, there was another trial with serafinib where they added on a second um, angiogenesis inhibitor in hopes of improving um, tumor control with the second drug adding, added to the standard drug, serafinib. Um, that's the, it's the trial in the middle there. Um, and unfortunately, the additional drug, um, sorry, the additional drug did not improve outcomes um, to serafinib. But the last trial on the bottom, which um, uh, both Dr. Hudson and uh, Dr. Yonash mentioned, was a phase three trial, once again, a randomized trial comparing now not a placebo, but a standard of care, serafinib, to a new therapy, exitinib, that proved clearly that exitinib was a step forward. Um, it may be a small step forward, but it is a step forward for our patients. And, and now we have that, that clear answer. 
That led the FDA to, improve, uh, to approving this uh, new, hopefully second generation angiogenesis inhibitor uh, for our patients earlier this year. So what's coming? Well, hopefully drugs that are more effective and less uh, toxic. There are a series of phase two and three trials that are coming close to reporting their results and you'll be hearing about them in the next year. Um, they have names that I listed up here, um, Compares, um, Record 3, uh, TiVo 1, which you heard a little about, Toracel 404. We can, we'll talk a little bit about what those are and what to expect um, from those trials. We also can talk a little, we also talked a little bit this morning about targeted immunotherapy and the, the role of vaccines and ultimately combinations that, that might make sense. All of these are being actively tested and we'll know a lot more in the next year. So there are several trials um, trying to improve upon sunitinib, which is the, um, the, the most prescribed treatment uh, for patients with metastatic kidney cancer in 2012. Though the COMPARES trial is comparing sunitinib with pazopinib, which is Votriant. Um, the, the makers of Votriant hope to show that it's as effective as Sutent and maybe less toxic. We'll see that result later this year. Um, obviously, drugs that are less toxic are worth developing. The other trial looks at the, the proper sequence of, of um, this record three trial. Should you start with Sutent and then switch to um, Affinitor, or should you start with Affinitor and then move to Sutent? So we'll get some more information about uh, the proper sequence of using Sutent, um, hopefully with the record three result. We mentioned the um, AXIS trial, which compared exitinib to serafinib and led to exitinib's approval, which was a step forward. Another step forward as far as these second generation angiogenesis inhibitors, hopefully will be this uh, TiVo-1 trial, which um, Eric mentioned, which compares a new, um, more, more specifically targeted angiogenesis inhibitor, tevozinib to serafinib, and showed that it was more effective than serafinib. So once again, we're coming up with agents that are better than the agents that we had uh, five years from now. Uh, another important uh, trial will compare a standard uh, TOR inhibitor, Toracel, to serafinib again. And to answer the question, when you failed prior treatment like Sutent, what's better, to give you another drug like Sutent or to switch you to a completely different uh, approach, which is the uh, Toracel drug? So we'll, we'll be learning a little bit more um, about the proper sequencing of these um, agents. And all of this information should be coming soon. The Tavazinib data will be presented at ASCO, and hopefully the Toracel data will be presented later this year. So combinations, as uh, Eric alluded to, most oncologists think if one drug is good, two's got to be better. So there have been a lot of combination trials done thus far. Most, I have to say, have been somewhat disappointing. Um, and we'll talk about the reasons why that is. But hopefully, as we get less toxic agents and we get smarter about making, putting these things together, we'll make some progress. You can hear these are some of the, the drugs that have been used in, in combination. Um, certainly laboratory trials have suggested we don't just do this willy-nilly. Certainly laboratory studies have shown that two drugs is often better than one, but there are several important issues. One of them is cost. These drugs, as you all know, are not cheap. Uh, the other is toxicity, uh, and so far many of these combinations have proven um, pretty toxic when given, uh, when given together. Here are, some, here are two trials that are looking at combining a, a blood vessel strategy with uh, TOR inhibitors. This is looking at the, the record two trial looks at bevacizumab and everolimus together versus the standard of bevacizumab and interferon. And the interact trial looks, like, looks at bevacizumab and temsirolimus. These are both large trials that will give us an answer to the question of is two approaches to, tr to attacking the cancer uh, better than just one at a time. We'll, we'll see that going forward. Um, as you all know, as we've talked about multiple times today, none of, uh, very few of these treatments produce remissions, um, and we obviously need second and third line uh, treatments. There are a couple of trials that are uh, accruing that will give us some answers to that. There's a, another, um, another angiogenesis inhibitor, this agent called TKI258, that's now in phase three trials. And it's once again comparing to serafinib, so that might be a, be a step forward as well, looking at, in the, in the cooperative group trial, looking at combinations um, on top of everolimus, adding uh, bevacizumab um, in hoping that that will improve outcomes more than everolimus does. We'll see. 
We talked a little bit of this morning about targeted immunotherapy and its potential. Um, we talked about vaccine treatments. I alluded to one trial, uh, one phase three trial, uh, looking at combinations with a dendritic cell vaccine and Sutent. There's actually more than one trial. This Imatix trial here on the right um, looks at another um, peptide vaccine, also in combination with uh, sunitinib. Um, hopefully that will lead to more durable benefit uh, with this drug. It's, it's great that they're actually being com compared in large phase three trials. It will give us uh, clear answers, but this information is, uh, is probably a little bit longer away because these trials are still enrolling patients. Um, we mentioned a PD-1 antibody earlier. Um, this is one of the more exciting forms of targeted immunotherapy being developed. Two points that I didn't make this morning uh, that I'd like to make um, now is this drug is so should soon be entering phase three trials. It's moving pretty quickly. Um, hopefully the phase three trials will open later this year um, and if positive might lead to the drug's approval. But just as importantly, there's more than one PD-1 or PD-L1 agent in development. These are five separate companies, all of whom have decided this is an important pathway and are developing different ways to blocking this barbed wire that I talked about um, that protects cells from attack by the immune system. So you'll be hearing a lot more about these agents in not just in kidney cancer, but in other tumor types as the year goes on. Um, this, Chris Wood covered this very well early, so I won't, I won't beat this to death. But we're also doing clinical trials with drugs that have been shown to improve survival for stage four patients. We're now using them in stage two and three patients. And it'll take, as he mentioned, it'll take several years to know if they delay, um, delay cancer coming back after surgery or they prevent cancer coming back from surgery. Obviously, there's a big difference between those two. But we're several years away from knowing these results. But the great news about these trials is they are accruing well. Patients have gone on them very quickly, much more quickly than we expected. So while the drugs themselves may have issues for early stage patients like side effects or when we'll have to see about effectiveness, and the patient community has been very motivated to go on trials like this. So hopefully as we get better drugs, we can then test them in the early, stage, uh, early stages of kidney cancer and prevent recurrences. I mean, that's where we can make a, a huge, um, huge impact, preventing the need for treatment for stage four cancer. So in just in sort of closing, I think, you know, this is obviously one fundamental question for folks who haven't considered, you know, doing a clinical trial, you know, what's, why should I do it? Um, I mean, certainly I think, and I'm obviously incredibly biased because it's what I do, um, is that I think it gives you access to cutting edge approaches. Now, obviously cutting the newest thing isn't always better and sometimes it's more harmful. We've certainly seen multiple cases of that. But I do think you get access to things sooner than you might if you don't consider trials. And I do think we're doing a little bit better, as I mentioned, picking treatments than we were 10 years ago, and also picking patients for those treatments. We're a little bit smarter. Um, we're, we're having more positive trials. But all that being said, the participation um, for cl cancer clinical trials in the US is still less than 3% of all patients. So when you think about it, I can sit up here and talk all day about all the things I'd like to do, and Eric's got great ideas, and Tom's got great ideas, and Chris Wood's ideas are okay. But the, um, we can't do it without, without participation, you know, and, and convincing um, people to come and, and sacrifice, because they are sacrifices to travel and put some, you know, take some risk with newer treatments, that takes a lot. And it really requires, you know, mobilization of the the whole group of people, the whole community of kidney cancer people. So hopefully events like this will improve people's willingness to participate in, in trials, getting that message out about why it's important. There are a lot of reasons why you might want to consider it, but you know, one of the questions people ask is, is you know, what else is in it for me? I know what's in it for the field and for other patients, but what might be in it for me personally? One thing you could think about, and this is uh, Dr. Bukowski's slide, but I agree with it, um, there's some people who think the care on clinical trials is better. Um, you could argue that back and forth, but you're certainly followed much more closely on a clinical trial than you would be if you weren't um, on, a, on a trial. Um, you're being not only watched very closely for side effects with more frequent visits, but you're being watched very uh, carefully for is the treatment working. And there are a lot of rules set up to protect you from not only side effects, but ineffective treatments, we, there are rules by which we have to remove you from a trial if it's not in your interest. 
And most importantly, you can always stop at any time you want um, once you've joined a clinical trial. The other question, um, which is a little bit harder to address, is do patients on clinical trials do better? Um, and he, he has uh, possibly here on his slide, and, and he notes this interesting data that was just presented last year. This is looking at uh, 238 phase three clinical trials of all cancers um, done in recent years. And when you look at this slide, it's a little bit complicated. Um, I didn't want to give too much data in this, but I think it's kind of important. For the, the percentage of, for the, number, the 158 trials that reached their goal, as far as they enrolled the, the amount of patients they thought, which is this sufficient accrual, that was about two-thirds of the phase three trials. So not all trials reached their uh, uh, goal for patients, which is a problem. But of those that did, most of those trials showed positive results. In fact, 143 out of 158 had positive results. There were some that had negative results or had, were closed early because of side effects, but it was a, a relatively small number, only 15 on this slide, whereas most, the, the highest reason for the trial not succeeding, which is a third of trials, didn't get enough patients on them. So this makes a couple points. One, we gotta get more patients on trials so we can answer this question, but also a lot of the trials that we're doing have it certainly advanced the field, but a help, we think, the patients who go on them. Um, and you can't, it's hard, that would be hard to prove, but it's certainly worth considering. Uh, there may be some advantages for you as an individual when you're considering uh, clinical trials. So in conclusion, I think clinical trials advance our knowledge, and I, I think they've improved outcomes in kidney cancer, um, and it's been a great effort by many patients. Over 6,000 have gone on, on these trials that we've talked about over, over the day, and it, it, not only improving patient outcomes for themselves, but also the future way that we treat patients and coming up with better treatments for people who fail is only going to happen with research. So we need to keep, keep working on it. We need to define new approaches. We need to extend treatment earlier in uh, disease. And we also need to focus about the patients who are unable or un, um, don't qualify for trials. What do we do with those folks? We need to do a lot more research in that area, but hopefully in partnership, we can continue to make progress over the next decade like we've made it over this last one. Thank you very much. Join us again next month for another edition of Kidney Cancer News. I'm Carrie Konoski, wishing you good health.